Great. Thanks uh, for, to the uh, organizing committee for inviting me to speak here again. It's always a fantastic me meeting to come back to. <clears throat> These are my uh, disclosures for uh, today's uh, talk. So I'll be, uh, the majority of this presentation is based on the updates for dual antiplatelet therapy in 2016. And it really focuses around um, this uh, concern now about the optimal duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. And at the end of this presentation, it may actually confuse you more so than what you're used to right now, but hopefully I'll show you some evidence to support either side. So uh, again, I have to do this in 15 minutes, so I, can, I can't uh, show you much or all of the historic information, so we'll be very brief with that. And then we'll move on to the argument about uh, DAPT uh, shorter being better. And then I'll really focus on the uh, data supporting longer duration dual antiplatelet therapy in a selected uh, patient population. And then we'll talk about this idea about, uh, well, when you have a patient, uh, you know, are there uh, risk scores available to help you decide upon shorter versus longer duration therapy? And uh, then we'll end off with what I think is going to change in the future. I, I'm not sure that this, uh, what we call DAPT, um, uh, will, will be around, uh, that concept will be around five, ten years from now. So um, brief uh, story about DAPT, I'm just going to show a picture. Uh, we're obviously used to dual antiplatelet therapy being aspirin and clopidogrel. Uh, this was our only choice for, for a very long time and really has become the standard of care. And I think we've become very good as Canadians uh, in terms of treating all of our ACS patients effectively with dual antiplatelet therapy. But the duration has always been 12 months. And that's largely based on, on clinical trial data, of which was only run to 12 months. And the question, I think, on all of our minds was, uh, uh, you know, can we get away with longer therapy and is it beneficial to you? Um, but again, at this point in time, in the era of uh, aspirin and clobidogrel being our only choice, uh, we didn't know that information. So I, I put this in the historic part of the slide presentation. Uh, because this is published in 2009, and we're now in 2016. Obviously a big game changer in terms of our um, dual antiplatelet strategy, uh, particularly for acute coronary syndromes. So I'm just going to fly through these slides uh, uh, quickly, but of course this is uh, in relation to the uh, very important PLATO trial. And um, you know, obviously PLATO supports the, the use of, of ticagrelor. Uh, but I just wanted to spend a minute to, uh, to really talk about this agent and, and really um, explore the reasons uh, why this is really set aside as the optimal uh, P2I12 receptor antagonist. Um, as many, many of you in the audience know, this is a direct acting drug. Uh, it's not like prazogrel or, or, or clopidogrel that require uh, some sort of conversion process in the liver. As soon as you ingest this, so to speak, and it's in your bloodstream, it's actually working. Um, and uh, hence the, the rapid onset of this, uh, of this therapy. It's obviously a more powerful P2Y12 receptor agent as opposed to uh, clopidogrel. And the unique feature of, of, of this agent is that it's reversibly bound. And I always get this question as to what it means to be reversibly bound, but essentially all the other agents stay on the platelet till the platelet dies. But uh, as we all know, uh, ticagrelor, once stopping the agent, it comes off the uh, P2I12 receptor in, in a few days. Uh, so that is another unique uh, feature of this agent, and uh, you know I know this is a heart team summit, and I think it's really important for the for the cardiac surgeons to understand this concept as well. That uh, you know I know what the guidelines say, but uh, you know you can potentially uh, operate on a patient uh, on ticagrelor sooner after discontinuation compared to some of the other agents because of this reversibly bound of, uh, phenomenon of of, of uh, ticagrelor. So I'll take you quickly through the uh, PLATO study design. I think this still does have implications even in, in today's uh, environment. Uh, remember that this was all acute coronary syndrome patients, uh, of which included non-ST elevation MI and ST elevation MI patients. But I really want to focus on the ST, eleva uh, ST elevation MI. Uh, patients, as these were all primary PCI patients, and you know anything that we do otherwise, i.e., those that get a pharmacoinvasive approach at its current stage, is off-label. 
Um, so again, according to Plato itself, uh, use of this agent in STEMI is just really reserved for patients who, who undergo primary PCI. And these patients, of course, uh, I think it was uh, almost 19,000 patients, uh, randomized to a clopidogrel-based uh, strategy versus ticagrelor, recognizing that if you were randomized to a ticagrelor-based strategy, approximately 40% of these patients were already loaded on clopidogrel and then received a subsequent load of ticagrelor in that arm, hence validating the use for us in the cath lab in terms of switching them uh, in the cath lab and rebolusing them at the same time. Endpoint was uh, the classic CV death MI stroke out to uh, 12 months. And uh, again, we're, we've all been used to seeing these curves time and time again, uh, as, as as shown here in terms of uh, efficacy with the reduction of CV death MI stroke. Uh, Ticagrelor is the winner compared to clopidogrel. And again, I don't have to remind you about the uh, mortality benefit alone with this agent in a fairly contemporary time where we have very good medical therapy on board already. Um, so this really, uh, and I'm glad Jeff uh, is in the audience, uh, I mean, has really changed our, our Canadian guidelines. Um, you know, this is, I always show this figure to reinforce the fact that, uh, you know, when you present with an ACS, it doesn't matter if you get angioplasty, it doesn't matter if you get uh, surgery, uh, it doesn't matter if you're just treated medically. Uh, dual antiplatelet therapy is effective, and our first choice in terms of our go-to P2I12 receptor is ticagrelor. Uh, and if for whatever reason that's not a possibility, then uh, you know consideration for clopidogrel is reasonable. So again, uh, it uh, you know at this stage, and again this was was published in 2013, really supports uh, the use of more potent agents uh, in ACS. But again, here it says just for 12 months. So now we're in the era of really good drug-eluting stents. So we've got these second-generation drug-eluting stents with these fluoropolymers that seem to be anti-inflammatory uh, with a very low profile uh, stent struts. And what we're seeing now is that stent thrombosis does not seem to be much of an issue. I, I think uh, earlier on today, rates were quoted as, uh, as low as 0.4% for stent thrombosis, and that is consistent with with the majority of, of, of the clinical trial data that's out there. So really, uh, it's a major step forward with these second generation drug eluting stents. We don't have to worry about stent thrombosis as opposed to the cipher and taxis days where we really had to use a year of, of that therapy and, and perhaps even more. So uh, because of this, and because it was widely known now that uh, you, know, you can get away with a shorter uh, uh, DAPT uh, with with uh, with the second generation DES, uh, the it had to be tested. It had to be tested in a randomized fashion, and so uh, there are a whole host of what I would argue to be smaller uh, clinical trials that have looked at this uh, this uh, shorter duration versus uh, a longer duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. There's uh oh. There's um, a whole host of meta-analyses that are out there, and I'm just gonna present to you what I think are the most uh, pertinent ones. But in my argument for uh, a shorter dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, I really do think this is the patient where you're very concerned about bleeding. So that's why I put this here. If you're really concerned about bleeding and you wanna pre prevent uh, subsequent or recurrent bleeds, this may be the strategy that you'd want to choose. So this was a, a, a very important uh, meta-analysis by Palmarini, uh, published in Jack 2015, looking again at this concept of short versus long dual antiplatelet therapy with DES. And uh, with this first meta-analysis, you can see that there's only four trials. Uh, we've got you know anywhere from uh, 1,500 to a little over 700 patients um, uh, per arm uh, in these studies. So uh, smaller sample size, um, and of course this is mainly in a stable non-ACS environment, and was really testing the concept of either three to six months versus mainly uh, a year of, of dual antiplatelet therapy. And according to this meta-analysis, it shows us that with the composite endpoint of uh, death MI and stent thrombosis, there was really no difference with a 
what I call regular duration or what they call long-term duration dual antiplatelet therapy versus a three to six month duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. So that's encouraging in terms of a safety aspect. And of course, as what we would expect, uh, the uh, chance of, of any bleed was certainly less with a, a, a shorter duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. So to, in my mind, this at least proves to me that it's safe. In the selected patient population, it's safe to stop at three to six months. I really encourage everyone in the audience who's interested in this, uh, in, in, in the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy, to read the state-of-the-art review uh, published by Montalesco and, and, and Jack uh, last year. Uh, it's a really nice summary of, of the evidence. Uh, and more importantly, he actually updated uh, that uh, previous meta-analysis to include a very important, moderately sized uh, uh, randomized control trial called ISAR-SAFE, uh, which was testing the same concept between six to 12 months. Uh, but again, um, what he's shown us, and again here in his, his meta-analysis, he focused strictly uh, for e efficacy looking at uh, recurrent myocardial infarction, showing you that, as you can see, the po point estimate is, is fairly similar, that again, it's safe to use a shorter duration, anywhere from three to six months, of dual antiplatelet therapy compared to your regular dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, and that we don't need to worry about recurrent MI. Uh, and of course, as expected, a shorter duration of therapy will reduce your risk of a major bleed. So this is, you know, I really, I think Shamir presented this uh, uh, this morning. Um, and I, this is an important trial. It's an important study that had come out of TCT and and is published in the New England Journal of Medicine, really pushing this concept further to say, in a randomized fashion, can we get away with one month of dual antiplatelet therapy uh, versus a bare metal stent, which of which we are used to giving uh, one month of, uh, of, of dual antiplatelet therapy. And what they showed here was that, uh, you know, it, it was non-inferior and it actually met uh, superiority as well in terms of a drug eluting stent being better than a uh, bare metal uh, stent in that domain. But it's critically important to understand that this is a very specialized stent, a Biolimus A19 drug coated stent, which is a polymer free DES, uh, and again, a very specialized uh, stent for this purpose only. We don't have randomized data today to date to support this concept in an EES domain. So that's why I want you to be very careful in interpreting these results at one month. There are ongoing very large RCTs that will hopefully fully address this issue. There's the Global Leader Study uh, looking at, again, the concept of one versus 12 months, but again, using the Biolimus uh, 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 drug eluting stent. And then I think a very important study, uh, the Twilight study, that is testing a very unique concept uh, in that um, can essentially at three months dropping the aspirin and going with monotherapy versus dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, and that monotherapy uh, at three months is, is, is ticagrelor. So uh, a lot of interesting data to, to come uh, in, the, in the next few years. So, Again, we'll just uh, I'll kind of present the data uh, fairly briefly, looking at the uh, benefits of longer duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. And in reviewing this literature, I'm convinced that really why we're doing this is to reduce REMI. And we're doing it particularly in patients who have had a history of a myocardial infarction or who present with a myocardial infarction. I like to show this slide uh, that Deepak Bhatt had, uh, had published in JAMA. Uh, looking at the REACH registry and, and telling us that, you know, yeah, you know, at a year's time, within a year, your, your recurrent ischemic events are high, but they continue to happen after a year's time. And so that means that we can improve upon our therapies after a year's time to mitigate the uh, subsequent ischemic risk profile that we see after a year. Everyone knows this data very well. This is, of course, a subgroup post hoc analysis from the CHARISMA trial in the patients who had a prior myocardial infarction and showed that extended uh, dual antiplatelet therapy with an aspirin clopidogrel strategy was superior uh, to aspirin alone, but again, a post hoc exploratory subgroup, not a randomized study. Uh, but this, because of that data, really pushed the DAP trial and the Pegasus trial to move forward. 
We all know the results of the DAP trial. I'll review it very quickly. These two trials have some uh, are similar, but are also dissimilar. And so with, with, uh, with the DAP trial, what's important to understand is these patients were on their dual antiplatelet therapy, roughly about 40% were ACS, the rest were non-ACS patients. And at that 12 months where they're now gonna stop versus, uh, usually stop, they're randomized to continuing with their dual antiplatelet therapy versus continue with aspirin only. And uh, really looking what the outcomes were at 30 months. Very important to understand that this, uh, this is a, a trial that does apply to the current stents that we use. Uh, you know, a, almost uh, half of these stents were Avrolumis second generation drug eluting stents. Also important to understand that clopidogrel was the main uh, P2I12 receptor that was used, prasugrel less so, and ticagrelor at the time was not available. Co-primary uh, endpoint of stent thrombosis, of course, do, uh, extended dual antiplatelet therapy wins. Uh, with, uh, w compared to uh, monotherapy with aspirin alone, not surprising. Uh, in terms of their mace of death, MI, or stroke, again, uh, a, an extended dual antiplatelet regimen uh, uh, seems to be of benefit compared to uh, monotherapy alone, out to 30 months. And ev everyone's seen these inflection in the curves, really to, to represent what happens when uh, we discontinue an agent. So if you're on your dual antiplatelet therapy and you stop your P2Y12 receptor, you're seeing these inflections in the curve, which uh, the hypothesis is that perhaps when you stop your therapy, there's a little bit of an increased risk of, your, of a recurrent event at that time. Uh, and um, what's also critically important from the DAP trial is that yes, uh, the reduction in myocardial infarction was in part related to the stent, but more so, 55% of the reduction in MI was from outside the stent. In other words, your dual antiplatelet therapy is treating the whole coronary tree. It's not just treating your stent. Of course, as expected, uh, bleeding would be higher with, uh, with an extended dual antiplatelet strategy. Really important study, uh, because then they said, uh, with, with the DAP trial, they said, okay, well, let's separate it out and see what the benefits are for those patients who's, who've had a prior MI compared to those who have not had a prior MI and, or present with a myocardial infarction. And you can see that the incremental benefit is clearly there for a patient who presents with a myocardial infarction versus not with extended dual antiplatelet therapy. So Pegasus, uh, a little bit of a different design in that these were patients who were on their monotherapy and then if they, had, they all had a history of a myocardial infarction, but anywhere from one to three years, and then they were randomized at that point in time to uh, a ticagrelor-based strategy versus continuing with aspirin alone. Two doses tested in a randomized fashion. Both doses seem to work very well, uh, more so than, uh, than with, uh, with aspirin alone. Uh, and um, this, uh, the curves continue to start separating at a one year, but continue to separate beyond that, really supporting the fact that prolonged dual antiplatelet therapy uh, makes sense in that domain. Uh, and you can see a strong trend towards the benefit in CV death alone, reduction in myocardial infarction, and a reduction in stroke. Shortness of breath obviously is an issue with uh, ticagrelor, but what's interesting is there have been a few papers that have come out subsequent to this, and I was quite surprised to see that in these patients who you know, are stable with their myocardial infarction in the past, the discontinuation rate for ticagrelor with uh, subjective shortness of breath was only 3% per year. So I think very encouraging data. Uh, the bleeding, of course, is an issue, uh, but uh, what's important to focus here is that fatal bleeding and intracranial hemorrhage were not a major concern. The lower dose of uh, ticagrelor at 60 milligrams POBID, you can see, has a lower risk of TIMI major bleeding. This is now an approved therapy and will be coming to us fairly shortly. I'll end off with a really important meta-analysis by Jay Udell, uh, a Canadian uh, out of Toronto General Hospital. Uh, and um, essentially looked at uh, the now meta-analysis of long-term dual antiplatelet therapy in patients with a previous myocardial infarction. Because what I said, if this therapy is gonna work, it's gonna work in patients who've had a prior MI. And it was quite clear, reduction in MACE, CV death, reduction in MI, um, and stroke and stent thrombosis. So really supports the, the uh, do extended dual antiplatelet therapy in patients who have had a myocardial infarction. Bleeding, again, is an issue, but
But fatal bleeding and intracranial hemorrhage, the bleeds that we worry about the most, not as concerning. This is recently in, has in, is currently in press, updated uh, dual antiplatelet guidelines from the ACCAHA. It is now listed as a class 2B indication uh, uh, for uh, extended dual antiplatelet therapy with level evidence a, uh, uh, level, level of evidence A. So um, individualized DAPT duration, I think we all weigh the, the pros and cons of your patient in terms of their bleeding risk versus their ischemic risk. This is a nice algorithm that in that review article by uh, Jean Montalesco. But we now have a scoring system available. Uh, and this is called the DAP score, uh, which was tested uh, in the DAP study itself. A very nice scoring system. It's the first scoring system that I'm aware of that combines both ischemia and bleeding together as one score very user-friendly, very easy to use. And if you have a DAP score of less than two, the efficacy really makes no difference and only puts you at risk of a bleed. But if you have a DAP score of greater or equal to two, the efficacy in terms of reduction in stent thrombosis or, or MI, uh, reduction in MACE, uh, clearly wins with extended DAPT, and the risk of bleeding is not that bad. So uh, we actually clinically have been using this score a lot uh, or more so as it currently is really the only available combined score to help, uh, help us uh, address this issue. Future of antithrombotic therapy quickly, like I said, DAPT is here to stay, uh, but I don't know for how long because I think this concept of a dual pathway approach will eventually take off and that's really uh, targeting both the platelet as well as the coagulation cascade targeting the plate with, platelet with a potent antiplatelet agent and, uh, and targeting the coagulation cascade with oral uh, anticoagulation such as rivaroxaban. This is currently being tested in a phase two trial called Gemini ACS, um, which I think will shed some light and I think we're really headed towards a dual pathway uh, phenomenon in the future. So in conclusion, Dual antiplatelet therapy can be used as little as three months or as greater as three, uh, greater than 30 months. Balance, you really have to balance the risk between bleeding and MACE. Uh, we uh, really support prolonged DAPT in patients with a myocardial infarction, and the DAP uh, risk score can be very helpful. In the Canadian landscape, I think if you have an ACS right now, as our guidelines say, it's 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy. If your ischemic risk is high, you present with a myocardial infarction, 30 months. If your bleeding risk is concerning, you can get away with three to six months. What about in a non-ACS environment? Well, what we know of to date, second generation dr uh, drug looting stents are hands down better and safer than a bare metal stent. And I think unified across this country, from what I see, most people are getting second generation drug looting stents, bare metal stents are sitting on the shelf. So if you get a second de generation DES, it's 12 months, you really have to be pushed in a non-ACS uh, patient population to prolong your DAPT, so that's why I have a lot of arrows with ischemic risk. Otherwise, you can get away with three to six months of DAPT. Last slide is this is recently, uh, I think it's now in circulation. Again, a bunch of Canadian authors, including J.F. Tanguay, um, uh, which nicely highlights uh, this whole concept of indi individualizing dual antiplatelet therapy. Thanks. Well, thanks for this excellent presentation. For the sake of time, we will move immediately to Jean-François Tanguay.